On today's episode of Higher Learning, we're joined by Federico Demerit, an HR executive who's had an illustrious career with some of the biggest brands in the world. Federico has so much great insight to share, including how HR can be an incredible business partner for the organization, AI and its use in HR. We even talked a little bit of soccer and how it gets going in the United States. Federico has so many great insights. You're going to love this episode. I cannot wait for you to hear it. Welcome to another episode of Higher Learning. I am your host, Oz Rashid. Today, we are joined by a very special guest. We're joined by Federico Demarin. He is a people and HR executive, most recently at Group M, but also worked for Anheuser-Busch and Thomson Reuters previously. How you doing, bud? Hey, how are you? I'm great, great man. Great to be here. Glad to have you on. How's uh, are you, You're uh, in South Florida, obviously. How are you dealing with the rain and the flooding that we've had the last 48 hours? Uh, I'm looking at it through my window, <laughs> but actually today I, I was, I felt locked, so I went out and with my bike and and, and took a ride. Oh, good. Yeah, it was. Uh, there was like a, a state of emergency last night. All these different things. I woke up this morning, kind of got an idea of what what downtown looked like. Looked like it was okay. So, got in my car, came here. Uh, it's real lonely because most people aren't downtown right now because I think most people are working from home. But um, it's been good. You know, it's Florida, right? If you don't like the weather, wait twelve hours and. Uh, it'll be completely different. So absolutely. <laughs> so, brother, one of the reasons I was really excited to have you come on the show is because bit of a, a unique path into HR, uh, and I wanted to talk about that story. So, can you give me uh, an understanding of kind of how you started your career and how you eventually uh, migrated over to the human resources side? Sure, sure. It's funny because I started in in high school. I went to engineering uh, specialty, so I wanted to be an architect or an engineer, very, very different to what happened at the end. But basically, um, I started after that, I said, "Mm, I I don't think it's my future. A lot of physics, a lot of chemistry. I went to business administration. And in that moment, I was working in in, in marketing for a a, a beer company, Budweiser. It was great. Um, It was fun. I liked marketing, but it was not taking me to where I wanted to go, which was working with different countries and, and, and traveling. That was my dream. So I I got an offer for a Reuters. It was a news agency specialized in financial market information. So it has like two worlds. I didn't know anything about HR, honestly. I I I I I thought it was just the people that hire other people. But you know, it got me curious. They the agency that presented that to me told me this, this is a great leader. This is a, a company that can take you where you want to go. And, and that's how it started. So uh, quite quite interesting to move from a marketing role into HR, especially back then. That was in 1999, if I recall. So uh, very different times for, for the people function. Yeah. Like, I mean, I got to imagine. So I hope you had some sort of mentorship or some sort of training because your ability to go on the internet and research and certainly leverage chat GPT was just not there for you at the time. So how did you get up to speed? How did you going into a completely different world? Well, obviously there was a lot of curiosity first. I think if you're going into a new place, whether there is a new industry, a new function, you need to remain open, go with the blank page. You may have heard things, but you really need to listen. So my boss, she heard a lot of questions. She answered a lot of questions. She was very, very open to teach other people. And I had a colleague too that helped me a lot to understand what, so what was it about? What were, what were the functions? Which of course, they were much less than than the ones we have today. Wow. So you, when you, you told me that in our pre-call that you had not even really heard of HR and you grew up in Argentina, right? Correct. Okay, so I'm just interested. Is it what is the view and the role of HR in Latin America companies? Now, you've been in the U.S. now for a while. Is it different than the U.S.? And then, is there any kind of funny stories you have about the acclimation process, or was it something that was pretty natural for you and, and you picked up on pretty quickly? No, I mean obviously back then it was very administrative, and that I think it's pretty much the same as they have always been in the U.S. Perhaps the compliance aspect of the function has developed faster in the US than in, in, in Latin America. So the human component has taken more space. So basically HR was, if I have to summarize it, was the area where you have the people that hire other people, the ones that pay you, and the ones you can talk to when you have problems. 
Mm. That's a very simple way to define how he was. But that last part, the people you can talk to, was a very important one, which is, I would say, it's the main difference to what it, it is in the U.S. or what it was. It's not like you don't have people to talk to in the U.S. It's just that the compliance element, when you go to talk to someone in HR, was very different back then and in Latin America than what it is in the U.S. I mean, it's in here, it's definitely stronger than, and more developed. Yeah, but so let's dive into that a little bit. So people go talk to HR in Latin America. They're not as worried about the the, the governance and compliance aspect. Mm-hmm. Is it like a whole range of topics? Or like what would be kind of the reason? Like what, what are those conversations like in Latin America? Maybe, um, you know, uh, a bit ago. Absolutely. So first of all, there wasn't any government regulation. So for example, t- let's talk about harassment. Um, if someone will approach you confidentially and share something like my manager is just unbearable. He says mean things to me. He insults, uh, uh, you know, things like that. You will listen. You will suggest approach an approach, but you're not mandated to report that to the company. Mm-hmm. If the person says, please, I don't want this to be out. I trust you. This is a conversation between you and me. So you can help me out to sort this out. But in the US, if you're in HR, you cannot just hold that. You know, the company, you have an obligation towards the company and the company has obligations to to our regulation. So there are some things that you just, in LATAM, that could be seen as you're breaking the confidence. And I'm talking about obviously more in the past. Today, I think global companies have their own policies and regulations that have permeated all the countries in Latin America and and in a good way, they have elevated the function of, of uh, compliance against those things. Yeah. And you mentioned a couple of times in kind of a positive vein. I might, I might look at it a little bit the other way. I mean, America is known as being very litigious and, and having mm-hmm. like all different types of gotchas and different things mm-hmm. like that. And in some ways, it's very good because it's helping people that might not otherwise have a voice or are really, you know, getting real, really harassed mm-hmm. um, at the same time, like. There's a little bit uh, romantic is absolutely the wrong word, but just there's something about the going to your HR business partner, having them help you s- navigate solutions ha- ha- without getting everybody else involved. Um, you know, maybe there's a limit of uh, diminishing returns on that, but I could see that being a very also positive thing and that the intimacy to be able to communicate and share and help others and mm-hmm. take things on your own volition to go handle them. Um, I, there's something about that that seems somewhat appealing too. Where do you stand on that? No, definitely. I think as a human being, being able to talk to someone that is uh, is an expert on on solving problems like the ones you're sharing without being compromised to take action definitely could be seen as an asset for the individual but you know it is not very different to you know if you want to talk to a police about someone committing a crime and saying hey you cannot say anything you cannot do anything so at the end is it is it Right. You know, maybe you're talking to the wrong person. It's not your your HR you need to talk to, right? Mm-hmm. Because your HR has an obligation. And and I think it's, it's the two sides of the coin. Um, because they have a, that obligation, many of those things are surfaced and resolved. And companies can address those situations. And people are, are more careful about doing things like that because they know they're going to surface faster and more drastically. If it would be an an environment where the HR department keeps things confidential when they know those things are wrong, uh, it, it falls in in the hands of a person that has to decide is this right or wrong, uh, and it shouldn't be like that. If you want a a culture uh, and a way of working in your company, you need to have standards that needs to be respected. It doesn't mean you cannot talk to your HR guy. You just need to know that what you're saying breaks the rules. Or the law, of course, he has an obligation. You need to know it. And and I think training is key for that. You need to train individuals to know that if you address this, someone will take care of it. But be mindful that once you address it, it doesn't go away. No longer confidential information. Exactly. It's it's a lot of training for individuals, for managers, and for the people in the HR department. Super interesting. One of the things that I really have admired about you is that you're one of the more technology forward HR mm-hmm. executives I've met. Has that been something that has been throughout your career where like, are you an early adopter of all different types of software throughout your career? Has that always been something? Yeah, I always felt, you know, pulled towards technology. Um, maybe it was that part of the engineering <laughs> that didn't go away. Um, 
but you know technology has always been easy for me mathematics uh, and and things that are on that in, on that area of science that i felt close to um i've always since that, those times of reuters reuters was a forward looking company they had the hris in the very early times with oracle and and those companies that started to work with systems and they will continue innovating so i had the chance to prove different systems and dedicated to different things in the HR department. So I actually had an in, an international assignment when well, I was in Argentina to Switzerland. And in, uh, interestingly, they were behind the curve in the use of the technology than what I was in Argentina. And it was probably due to the, probably the, um, uh, the generation, right? The people that were used more to papers, um, and I was the tech guy in the the whole department. I I did research, I did surveys, I did things they never never done before, just using simple technology. So, yeah, I think it's fun, especially if you know what you're trying to achieve. I think the worst thing is to have technology just for the sake of having it. Technology sake, yeah, exactly. There's got to be some sort of just like with everything in HR. How can we tie this back to a business yeah. objective? How can we tie this back to value for the organization? Um, and I think that's a really important mindset when you sit in that space. In particular, obviously, AI is something that, that a lot of people are talking about. I'm very passionate about how you can leverage mm -hmm. AI, obviously, in the talent acquisition space. I know you've been at the forefront of trying to integrate AI uh, into organizations um, from an HR and people operations perspective. Where where have you, what have you worked on? What have you seen? And then do you have kind of a general sense of like, what are some of the initial applications and fastest applications of AI that, and AI that HR is going to have? Sure. Of, of course, this is an emerging technology. It's still... Um, there's a lot of noise around it, but uh, there are some very critical things that you can start doing. First of all, you need to understand that this is something you need to embrace. It's not it's not just a toy that will go away. It's a fantastic change that can elevate every job or every function, not just HR. But in HR, there's a lot of admin. There's a lot of, of repetitive things um, that you can automate with AI. And, and making it better and better. So, for example, uh, you know, recruiting is one thing. How do you filter and sort through thousands of applications in a way that you know every time you do it, it gets smarter. Uh, you deal with documents, you deal with job descriptions, you deal with presentations, just like any other function. Um, AI can help you a lot to automate those things and and release time for people to focus on more interesting things. So, I think that's a very clear low-hanging fruit that companies should start embracing but the most important thing for me behind that is to start communicating the technology to mm. start showing individuals like hey this is a new tool why don't you play with it you know i can teach you there's a e-learning there's a training there's a session so people get familiarized and they understand that it's not you know the terminator it's just like imagine if you're presented with a computer when, when at the time you were using a, a, type, a typewriter, you would not be afraid that the computer will kill you, but people were afraid, oh, I'm going to lose my job. This is the same thing. It will make your job so much easier and faster if you know how to take advantage, advantage of it. Uh, now, obviously, just like in the same way internet changed things, there might be some jobs that could be at risk. For example, if you're a person working in a library and your job is just to go and find information in, in books, yeah, that disappeared. You can find everything with a click. Uh, with AI, if your job is just to type you know, words on paper and just print and copy, and those kind of jobs should disappear with AI because everything would be so fast and automated that you don't actually need to type simple repetitive things anymore eventually it will grow. And, and this is, you were asking about the potential and companies can start doing. Uh, I was working on a project where we can start creating an experience in onboarding, connecting the information that people have outside of a company with the information that we have inside a company, you know, job descriptions, success factors for specific roles, uh, training modules that you may have in your LMS, and start producing, you have AI producing tailor-made onboarding experiences. So um, there's a lot of things that need to happen that to, to, be, to, to be real. And in, system integration is one. So I would say that's another important 
stepping stone to use AI. You need to understand where your data is, how your data is connected. So if you have an HRIS, is it connected to your LMS? Is it connected to your applicant tracking system? Or are just things disjointed? The more connected they are, the easier it will be to use uh, AI to gather insights and produce outcomes that are better and better with time. So I think it's is the right time to start making projects, especially if you're doing research and development. And from HR, you can also do it with any other function because I think it's, especially in, in share services, in, in call centers, in marketing areas that they have to produce content presentations and training modules. It's a great way to do that without investing that much, that much time. Yeah, I, I think, listen, this has this become cliche now, but it's not necessarily that AI is going to take your job. It's more that the person who's using AI will take your job. I agree with you. There are certain administrative and very blocking and tackling tactical type uh, roles and responsibilities that will either make your job evolve into something more strategic uh, or human centered or eliminate them altogether. Right. And so it's important that can you imagine anybody working in 2024 that didn't know how to leverage the internet, right? Like it's a similar type thing. Like this is the technology that you got to get on board with and you got to understand. I think another thing though, is that there is a little bit of a hype cycle is not the right way to put it, but I do think that the application of it is still being understood because the technology at this point is pretty incredible. And like the, mm -hmm. the, the use cases I've seen at the top 1% of things that they can do is amazing. And yet you don't necessarily see that in day-to-day -day life yet. You don't necessarily see that in day-to-day -day business application. In fact, I, I read some sort of ridiculous uh, uh, investment uh, number. It was it, it might have been trillions, but it was certainly um, really, really high um, in terms of AI-funded uh, technologies. And the actual return on AI-built technology is like 10 billion. So it was like a one in 100th right, uh, application of what's being built. So I think we're going through this time where there's a lot of uncertainty of what it's going to do on our day-to-day -day basis. There's going to be some, it's going to take some time. It's going to be phased because these things do take adoption, right? There's the early adopters who always jump in. And I, quite frankly, I fall into this trap a lot because I'm seeing a lot of like, oh, look at this use case. Look at what they can do now. But the reality is, is that that stuff from being used day-to-day um, it's still probably a little bit away, right? At the same time, it's incumbent on professionals to be able to get up to speed with it. And I think one of the things you brought up that's really interesting is that really onboarding on the HR side, I think is a really interesting use case because I, most companies that we work with, some of them don't do any type of training and onboarding at all. Or if they do, it's very, very light. Um, and then if they do, it's like this boilerplate, like cookie cutter, here's how we train, here's what we do. And yet, if you understand throughout the hiring process what somebody's, you know, what they're exceptional at, what they know and what they have, like, you know, expert level knowledge on and what are the areas of their gaps. And if you go through the process and know that, still hire them and then you bring them on to the onboarding process and you can tailor learning, development, training and onboarding to the areas of need rather than areas of redundancy. Um, you're going to have way faster ramp up time. You're going to create a way better onboarding experience, which we all know leads to longer tenure and less attrition. Um, and quite frankly, you're going to be able to hire people that maybe you would not have hired previously because you have a very strong understanding of what tools you can give them to ultimately be successful. So I think that's awesome. And I think that's something that I see you know coming sooner rather than later. And I think that's one of the awesome powers of AI potentially on the HR perspective. Is there anything that you use as a professional right now to get your work done? Or like, are you leveraging chat GPT to, 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 to do research? Are you asking specific questions for presentations you're doing? Like, what are you doing as an individual to try to leverage AI? So I've, I've used it in different ways. So uh, in, in group M, they had their own protected version of chat GPT. So it was easier because you don't have to go through the risk of sharing information you don't want out. So that's a good way to start playing and testing. Um, you can use all the information that you had available inside. For example, I could give you an employee handbook, a very simple use. And I can get uh, AI to say, okay, I need to understand. You ask a question, I need you to answer based on this employee handbook. Instead of you searching through the document for words or going into an in index, you put that into AI, you share that to individuals and you can, the, the, the AI through a bot can answer all the questions of an employee handbook. So how many days, vacation days do I have? Simple question, you know, one of the most typical questions you get from someone that is onboarding. Um, how do I get paid? Uh, you know, how, how, do you, how do you count absences? Whatever question is in that employee handbook. Same thing for any kind of policy or guideline or document that you have in HR. If you start compiling all of them, together in HR, 
in a place where the, the AI can access as a database, that AI can answer, that chat GPT can answer any questions about all those documents. So imagine instead of having a SharePoint with all the documents spread out and said, you need a policy, go for it. Uh, or someone in HR sending you a specific link, link to read it, you can just ask yeah. chat GPT yeah. and say, tell me this. Yeah, we're building that internally right now. I'm really excited about it because it is something that like you, all, all the different types of employees, as much as you train them, to where, here are our resources, here's what you need to know. There's always going to be times where they're asking you need to know. And that's why we see Klarna, right? I'm, I'm sure you heard about that use case a few months ago where they completely replaced their customer service and contact center, saving hundreds of millions of dollars. In fact, I read some, I read the CEO said something recently where they're doing no new hiring and that they have 20% attrition. And so that he's like, I mean, he's very much going to the extreme end and we'll see how that goes. I don't know that that extreme end will work, but they're real. They're not hiring anything. They're seeing where they can leverage AI. He has the right mindset for sure. I just see that being the number one first application and use case. This understanding of we get asked these questions, we we have these one-off situations, first call resolution, you know, time on the phone. These things can be super minimized and diminished while enhancing experience by having these LLMs and being able to 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 use a voice bot or a chat bot and be able to get those answers instantaneously rather than having to have a human sift through some things and answer the question for you. So I, I'm totally with you on that. And I think that's really good advice for anybody that's that or companies that are looking at how can we best start to implement this initially. That's probably it because we have so much documentation and so many different things out there and we're constantly spending time searching. The opportunity cost there must be so huge. And for a company that can leverage that and build those large internal large language models. And then you have that security and compliance perspective, like you mentioned too. So totally agree and, with that. And and that part for, for those that might be afraid, because obviously there's a lot of of, of information floating about the risks. And those risks might be real today, but they might not exist tomorrow because obviously when you get a new technology, then legislation forwards. So uh, and there will be more legislation to protect how information is managed, who gets to be paid or rewarded or recognized based on their, their uh, contribution in the open internet or not, I don't know. You know, but there there will be there will be legislation to start protecting the use of AI. It's just too new yet, and its applications are still a bit vague because there's it's in development. So, I think the easiest way is to get familiar with it. I, that would be the first, definitely the first advice for every any company and individual. Yeah, I think it's just so interesting with like the, the again, I'll use the word hype cycle because you see government getting way more involved, way quicker than they did, even with the internet and crypto and different things like that, because there's just like the power of AI and the potential of it, the things that we talk about with, um, you know, Skynet and all the stuff yeah. that stream ends where people get really fearful, right? There's this need to regulate, but at the same time, like, we have to be careful there because that could really stifle innovation because we don't understand everything just yet. To your point of what you mentioned earlier uh, around, you know, there's going to be a new business model around licensing your content and information to be used in these large language models. I don't know how it's going to break down or what's going to go out, but at some point to your point, hey, you can't just take my content and use it for your large language model. And I get, I don't get cited. I don't get anything. And one of the tools that I've been using for a few months now is perplexity. And what's really interesting is you can just type in any question and it'll give you the exact answer, which where Google, you had to click through links and like read through things. It'll give you the exact answer. It'll cite it. And then it'll give you five sub questions that you would typically ask under that. And boom, you can keep going. In. And it's like an amazing tool. Cool, but it's important that the the creators of this information, right, um, are getting some sort of like credit for that, right? And ultimately, ultimately, at the end of the day, like if we're being a little bit nuanced here, and this has been the case for a while, if you ask me what artificial intelligence really is, it's singularity, it's it's conception, right? Which you know is happening in some you know far off tank, think tank, but that's not we're not seeing that right now. Really, what this is is like heavy duty machine learning and these abilities to understand these different data points. They're still coming from human data though that's been in implemented somewhere and just much more accessible, much easier, much more convenient. Um, yeah. So anyway, that's my little rant right there. Go ahead. Anything you want to add? No, it's just it's just exactly as you said it. it and you know, if you look at if you think of the time where the the movie Terminator came up, um, you know, it was all about robotics. Computer combined with robotics, they take over the world. It wasn't even AI. Nobody mentioned AI. It was robotics and computers. This is 2024. Has it happened anywhere close? Do you have robots cleaning your house? I mean, you have the Roomba, of course, but it's very far from what the Terminator was. So I think 
you have to understand that it's a technology. It will enhance our abilities. It will help us just like the internet did. Um, yes, there might be some people that may lose their jobs, but I can tell you that those people can avoid that easily. Um, and also, you need to be careful with legislation. You need to understand what's happening, especially if you address it as a company, but also as an individual. You don't want to risk your company policies by using ChatGPT in the wrong way. So some basic information, it's it's needed, but don't be afraid. Just it's easy to find it and start testing and playing. I totally agree with you. Just like with the internet, there we, we see it with social media and different things. There's downsides to any new innovation, but the upside is always is always more and more impactful, especially right in large groups. And if you do find out that right kind of thread of regulation, um, I, I feel very excited about it and what it's going to do for the productivity of us as individuals, us collectively, as countries, as governments, as businesses. Um, it's a really exciting time. And you know what? Damn it. Did we just have two HR guys have one of the best AI conversations in the podcast world just now? I think that just happened. I appreciate that. I appreciate Thanks. you bringing it to the table and I appreciate you being so knowledgeable. I'm going to take this in a little bit of a different direction because sure. one of the other things we're talking about is we both got kids and you were telling me uh, recently that your son had played in an Inter Miami tournament. And I think Messi's kid was in, in was like on in the in one of the teams as well. So that's amazing. One of the benefits we get down here in South Florida. You're Argentinian, obviously. Uh, mm -hmm. Messi and, and and football uh, is something that's been, I imagine, a big part of your life. Did you play growing up? I did. I did. I played pretty much all my life in in a different way of what you see today in the U.S. Of course. Okay. So I'm just very interested. This is a very big question. It's something I talk about with a lot of my European and Latin friends, because there's always this dynamic of like us, whatever sport we put our time into, we become the best at. And I'd actually make the case that it's going the other way in the NBA and in other sports. But anyway, um, that hasn't happened. Like for whatever reason, like us has not been able to really make a dent in the world, which quite honestly is, is a lot of hubris to think that, that would ever be the case, but still, I'm cheering for the red, white, and blue to eventually start to be at a level where we can get deeper into the World Cup and do these things. So I'm just interested. It's a big question, but what's it like growing up and playing football in Argentina versus what you see here in the U.S. with your kids? How, what, what are the differences? I'm sure there are a lot of them. Yeah, I definitely. Obviously, you have to take into consideration the component of generations, of course. You know, it, it wasn't the same. 40 years ago than it is today. Uh, but I think the most important thing is growing up in Argentina, you you always have someone to play with close by without your parents. So that was the most important thing because you you can play for five hours. You know, you get out of school, you go, you knock on your neighbor's uh, door and say, hey, do you want to go play? Yeah, everyone has a ball. There's always a place that you can just kick the ball, put some things, some rocks, something to be the goals and start playing. And that's how I started. Uh, and like most of the kids in, in Argentina, we start playing as a game, not as a sport. Uh, it's fun. You start with freedom, which I think is key also. Kids love things they can improvise with because it's, it's fun. When it comes in, in the US, there's a lot of rules from the very early moment. You go into you I bring my kid into into soccer school and they start teaching them things um which they don't want to learn so dribble like I don't want you you know to spend five minutes dribbling the ball that's not fun uh, they want to play and they will learn to dribble as they play you don't have to teach them to dribble um but you know every school uh every soccer school in the US will teach kids pretty much the same thing first dribble then you juggle then you run, then you shoot. Uh, and it's more like school. You know, what I learned, it's, it was play. It was fun. And I, I, I read studies on that. It's a humongous yeah. difference, right? They're trying yeah. to teach you the tasks and the skills more so than, number one, developing a love of the game. But two, if you're playing and playing a lot and playing free, you're naturally learning a lot of those things anyway, right? And you're doing it in yeah. a much more uh, unstructured environment. I definitely agree with you on that. Go ahead, though. Keep going. Yeah. And and I think, you know, just the difficulty that I see is that is in the U.S. is very hard, especially nowadays, very hard for parents to let go on their kids when they're young. You want to be with them all the time. And you may not want to be five hours in a park <laughs> while they play soccer. But that's what we did because we had a lot of time and our parents you know, will give us that freedom for whatever reason it was back then. So today, how can you 
allowed your kid to have enough time to play without rules because mm. that's how you fall in love of the game. Then how do you allow your kid to watch football when the their span of attention is very short? So watching a football uh, soccer game on, on in the TV, it's it's hard for them. But that's how you also learn the passion of the sport. Not how to play. You may, you know, some kids would do, but it's the passion of the sport. And and I think also it has to be accessible for the people that have no no money. It cannot be that for your son or your daughter to learn how to play, you need to pay some school. You need to play for a tournament. These tournaments are not cheap. Uh, schools are not cheap. Coaches are not cheap. And I understand they, it's, it's jobs, right? But many institutions in Latin America are not for profit. And uh, they're clubs. And they play against other clubs. And you may have to pay a fee, but it's, that fee is minimum compared to what we pay here. Uh, today, here is more like a business. So if you want if you want soccer to become a, a real sport in the US, I think government and cities and counties, they need to understand, okay, where could they these kids play that is safe? Mm. Where could they play where their parents are not worried that you cannot let them play? And actually, I spoke with a couple of friends not long ago and some of the parents of, of, um, of all the kids saying, it would be great to have a social club where they are in an environment that is protected, like it's closed, it has a gate, it has fences. You cannot just get in and out as a kid and they can play sports. It can be only about soccer, but it could be about anything else. So you can, as a parent, you can be with them, but be, be doing something else while they play, or you can just drop them off and they will be with their friends. That's what I had. And most of the kids in Argentina, at least we had, that was safe for my parents. They wouldn't have to stick with me. So how do you do that? And how do you allow, allow kids in the US that have no money to pay for big training um, camps and things like that to play and to learn um, and have spaces for it? So I totally agree with you. I, I'm i going to give you my take on this, what I, what I think is a mm -hmm. lot of Americans. So I got into soccer around 2014. So my dad is German, okay? Mm -hmm. So I grew up cheering for Germany in the World Cup. And, you know, I was kind of interested, not interested. And then in 2014, the U.S. made a pretty good run. Um, and I remember in one of the last games, a pretty exciting game, they played Belgium. And mm -hmm. I remember watching that and, like, looking at the players on Belgium in awe. And at the time, it was, like, the, the golden age, right? You had Kevin De Bruyne. You had Vincent Company, You had Eden Hazard. And I remember watching these players and being like, God, these guys are awesome. Like, And then I started looking, where do they play, right? And I was looking at, you know, De Bruyne was in the Bundesliga at the time. Eden Hazard played in the EPL. Vincent Company played for Man City. And so then I started to kind of like follow those guys' careers a little bit. And then I started to get into EPL. And now I've been to Anfield. I love Liverpool. I've been cheering for, for quite a bit of time. And that's how I got into the game. So to your point, I, at first I had that very American sentiment of like, oh, 2-0 game. That's not very mm -hmm. fun. I started to understand the beauty of the game, right? What I think and what so what a lot of Americans would say is that our best athletes don't play. I think that's complete bullshit. I, I totally do not agree that that's the reason why the U.S. is not where – you know, they might want to be right in terms of the world stage of soccer. And because if that was the case, like it, soccer is a skill sport. Let's look at Lionel Messi, mm -hmm. what, five, seven, if that, like he's not one of the greatest athletes in the definition of athletic ability, right? He's one of the most skilled and talented athletes of all time in any sport. And so for me, when I look at it, and then if I go to like my park on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, there is no sport being played more by girls and boys of all ages in an organized fashion, to your point, than soccer. So there's a lot of participation in every city in America throughout the mm -hmm. country. Okay, my The problem is, and so now let's talk about German soccer because I know pretty well. If you go look at Die Mannschaft, right, and the, the machine and what they do over there, right? They obviously start at the highest level of the, the German national team. But then as you go down, there's ages and infrastructure all the way through that plays the same style that has the same principles, that has like a feeder system. There's a culture. 
it's all it's like any great organization, right? They have mm-hmm. these, these junior levels. And as you rise up, you're not mm-hmm. getting different coaching every time you're playing along the same lines. And that's why Germans have had great talent. Don't get me wrong. But I always feel like they're more a sum of their part than of their parts than the individual um, because they have such a great infrastructure and system. And so if we ever really wanted to get serious about it, and I'm getting upset now because we just lost 5-1 to Colombia, the U.S. Mm-hmm. We had a nice tie against Brazil, but I think it was the B team. And it's because I look at our coach and I look at our infrastructure and it's like they take a professional sports mindset of fire the coach after a couple of years and this isn't working out. You've got to have an infrastructure and culture built throughout all levels that permeates all levels if you really want to get serious about this on the world stage. And then, of course, I have to imagine in Argentina and and Brazil and Colombia that the government is involved because there's so much national pride and it's a national sport in a lot of ways. Right. Um, the, The government is all, but that's not happening here. So that's. That's my take on on how things could be better or we could start at least to move towards that. What do you think? You agree? No, definitely. I think it's a combination of of the magic of of the, a, a game combined with the infrastructure of a sport. Uh if you if you think about the US, you have it's the most played sport at young ages in the US. No question about it. So what happens? Why are those kids getting getting away from soccer and going perhaps into other sports or none at all. And especially the athletes, right? I think parents obviously have a lot to do. So you need to convince, you need to show those parents why soccer is an interesting sport, you know? And, and I was talking, having a great conversation with one of the other parents uh, in my, in my son's soccer team. She, she grew up with very American um, bringing her husband's family comes from a, a, American football players. So they're very into it. They went to college. They saw the American football. And now her son is playing soccer. And for her, it was something completely new. And and at one of the games, she, she, she at the end, she said, I never thought in my life that soccer could be this exciting. And of course, it's your kid. Everything, you know, when your son is competing, everything will be exciting. But the, how moments are built into the game in in what happens and the explosions during the game and the tension you need to get involved really like not just watching it for five minutes and say oh, nobody's scoring this is boring if you are approach it like that yeah you're gonna drop it and that's, that's one of the reasons why many people don't follow soccer as they follow other sports but if you approach it with someone that can share with you the passion someone you can connect to um you will discover it. And that's why the rest of the world is crazy about soccer. You understand not... the game within the game. It's very different. And quite frankly, yeah. that's the same thing with baseball. And then they went really hard on home runs and things like that. And the sport has actually diminished. But like, if you understand baseball, when a player gets on second base, what that means when a pitcher is pitching out of the stretch and different things like that, you're understanding the game within the game. That's what's happening in soccer too. And I'm a little bit of a snob around professional sports because I want to see the best players play. And so, you know, Honestly, I have a hard time watching MLS. I do. Like, like when I watch <laughs> EPL, right, and I'm watching, you know, Chelsea and Man City and Liverpool, the way that they're playing and the coordination and everything, I mean, that's the highest level of the sport. Uh, Ma- Real Madrid, Barcelona, same thing. So, yeah, for me, like, when you watch the best players play at an amazing level and how the foot just is like a magnet to everybody's foot cross field, uh, you know, it's just amazing to me. And the strategy is amazing to me. And I love it. I'm a big fan of sport. Last thing I'll, I'll ask you. So I know yeah. where you, you're, you're a messy guy. But your dad and your grandpa, Messi or Maradona? Um, Maradona, for sure. I mean, today? No, today I think Messi. And I think in, in the case, I never had the chance to to watch football with my grandfather. He died when he was young. But right. my dad, he, was, um, he wasn't a fan like I am or my son is. But he did like football. He did like to watch the games. He played with me. But he never liked Maradona because of his personality, which obviously I understand. I, re- I can relate to that, especially being a father. Um, it, you need to appreciate each athlete for what they bring. And I think Maradona brought things that were very different from Messi. Some were amazing as a sportman, uh, and Messi brought others. So I I tried to avoid, you know, that that Fair thinking enough. of, you know, this guy is better than the other one because they faced things that were so different. So the same with any other play like Pelé, they, uh, they, they're all great. They just faced different challenges. They, they, the sport was completely different. Uh, if you compare it, Messi, Maradona and Pelé, and they played it so differently. So comparing them is unfair. I think you need to take the best out of what they did, which was phenomenal for their own times and their own challenges. 
Yeah, I, I, the only thing I would say about Maradona that really sticks out and why I think he was so beloved um, and such an exciting player is that he's one of the few soccer players I've seen that would take over a game by himself, right? When we think about like the famous, you know, uh, mm -hmm. World Cup and 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 like he like he would just like he would put the team on his back and then usually it's an 11 player game you have to play within the game even Messi is making his teammates better and doing different things Maradona sometimes it would seem like much like you see in basketball with like a LeBron James where he'll just take over a game all of a sudden it's like whoa what just happened you would see that with Maradona that you don't see in 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 world soccer that much so I think that's what made it interesting but he also lived a very like I've seen some of the documentaries I mean just lived yeah. a life and i can see why you're life. say it's not a great role model for my son so it's, it's like a shooting star you know that, that that's the that's the, the the great thing about maradona it was fantastic to watch him yeah that, like a shooting star it does burn out eventually too which yeah so we got to pay the bills here we want to talk a little bit about hiring that's why you're here so let's open with this when you're hiring for your team or you're hiring for your organization do you have a core hiring philosophy that you typically stick to um yeah obviously it's it's very important that from from the people department you need to understand what you're offering to your business and what they should expect. So I would say if you want to summarize it, a very clear service level agreement. Second, you need to let them know how it works. Um, because sometimes expectations can fly all over the place. So you need to tell them, look, this is realistic. This is not. This is what you can get. If you get this, and I, I always try to have a very service-oriented mindset, like the answer should be yes. So I want to have the, you know, the God of programming. Okay, fine. It will cost you this. Uh, oh, no, I cannot pay you that. So the answer should not be no. So, okay, so I can offer you this. And if you invest this money, I can offer you that. If you pay for a headhunter, you can get this. If you pay for an agency, if you go to LinkedIn. So explain, but you know, always approach it as a, as a service that you're you're helping. It's not like, oh, here they come, you know, they ask for things that I cannot deliver and I have to tell them no. And then the struggle starts and they say HR is always saying no and they're always showing policies. So, you know, I think it's a mindset change. And recruiting has a lot of that because the demands can be overwhelming if you don't address it properly. And you're going to spend more time listening to complaints and explaining things they don't want to hear uh, rather than actually partnering for success. So I think my philosophy is definitely service. Second, when you go out, really understand where is the balance between experience and potential and how do you tap into that? Because it could be very different for different companies. Um, also, how do you act as a business partner and challenge their request? Because someone can tell you, I need this person with this level of experience, this level of seniority. Uh, I'm going to pay this. That, so do you work for the manager? Or do you work for the company? What is the right fit for the need? Not just the need is not, I need this. I need a senior programmer or a, or a senior marketing manager. The need is what they need to achieve. You know, think in terms of solutions, right? Not just a role, because then your job is very transactional. So if you want to move from transactional recruiting into strategic recruiting, you need to understand, okay, why is this position uh, existing? What do you need to achieve with it? What are the key tasks? And you as an expert then can position talent towards that need and not just a title, a salary, experience, MBAs, because, you know, as you said, you know, you know, many people in recruiting said, oh, there's the talent shortage in the market. There isn't a shortage. It's just that sometimes you ask for things that are not related. And of course, the filter, the more filters you put, the less people you'll find. But sometimes you ask for things that oh, I need an MBA. I need three languages. Like, why? What is the need? Oh, no. Occasionally, they may need to talk to answer an email in another language. Look, what does occasionally mean? Once or twice a year. Okay. Have you heard of? translator <laughs> have you heard of chat gpt have you heard of all these things that could save you thousands of dollars on, on, in, in a salary just because you're asking for a second language or whatever is it that you're asking for or like keep the role open much longer because you're yeah. these things that are not you know diminishing in terms of what the person's actual impact is going to be i think that's a really smart way to look at it and I, the thing that drives me nuts is uh you know i love how you framed it as transactional versus strategic and and, and 
so much of this world in this industry, a lot of times I see a commoditized transactional type approach that number one is very dehumanizing, ineffective, mm -hmm. costly, um, and just not giving enough um, credit and nuance and, 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 and capability to what it's like to do this in an intellectual way, in a strategic way, where you don't have to be searching for that Net, you know, a rehire two months later, six months later, a year later, because you didn't get it right the first time. And I deeply believe that we all have to evolve and move more to that. And I think there's a bottom line impact on that on every company. And so the companies that spend a lot of time, resources, thoughts, preparation around standardizing that and creating that strategic talent acquisition mindset also double as some of the biggest companies in the world, like Google and Amazon and Meta and, and, and companies like that. So I, I couldn't yeah, agree. Of course. What about from a memorable interview experience if i ask you about one does the one come to mind could be good could be bad could be you interviewing maybe you interviewing somebody else oh uh the, the always the most memorable memorable ones are usually the craziest ones and i remember uh when i was interviewing for um internships uh how kids would approach an interview without having an idea of what they were supposed to do and I saw, I remember res receiving a resume. The guy was at the door. So I get the resume because he brought it on paper. I said, okay, let me take a look at it. The first page was a picture of, of his face. So the whole page, oh, just yeah. his face. And he, he was cut from another picture, probably you know, partying at night or something. So I saw that picture. <laughs> like, what is this guy? applied to and it's an internship in in journalism i said okay so journalism can allow it a bit more of a free spirit so i said okay let me take a look at the rest and and i i read through it and i invited in and he was he was so casual and he asked me like can i ask you something like sure of, of course like what happens if i come to work and i don't like it can i just leave or do i have to stay uh like no yeah you don't have to stay this is this is not a jail right and questions like that that will shake me and the funny thing about that story is not all the crazy things that he did is the fact that we hired him he continued growing and developing and became an important uh, correspondent oh wow so this guy came in, you blew the interview did you did you recommend him to move forward or not yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we spoke with the manager, and of course, it's an internship. The risk is low. You know, it's not like he's gonna press the button to to blow up the world. But we said, you know, look at the the academic accomplishments. Look at how smart he is when it comes to sharing his opinion. Um, look how careful he is about explaining facts, which was a key element of journalism. Um, and I said, and he's a funny guy. You know, he's a good guy to have in a team. Not everyone's serious or, 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 or sharp. And it would be a good balance for the team. And, you know, that, that's what happened. And that's obviously, once goal. they get in, and they was... start understanding, you know, there's some formalisms to it to, to follow. And you, okay, they dress like this, they do this. They start institutionalizing, but without losing that thing that added diversity into the team. And I think that is the key element when you recruit, you you allow that element of differentiation to to exist in your company and not just institutionalize them completely so they become another person just like the, the ones around. Yeah, you don't want a homogeny. Definitely not. You want a diversity on the team. And I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier about understanding what you want and why it's important in a role and focusing on that. Whereas a lot of other people might have said, what is this picture? What is this guy's approach? Like, this isn't for me. And you end up having a great hire. I love that. What about a favorite question you like to ask? Do you have anything that that, that you like to ask in, in every interview? Um, I, I, there are some questions that I ask many, many times, and usually they're, they have follow-up questions. So, for example, tell me what you're most proud of about yourself and how you are. And they usually will give you – everybody will give you a good list. They probably practice those those words like i'm proactive uh you know and when they whatever they they say i i take notes and i say oh, the ones that i are related to what i would like to see i ask a follow-up question so tell me the most recent situation that you would consider the best example of how are you proactive and their faces were like oh shoot <laughs> i never thought i had to 
find an example. You know, people today are more trained into answer, you know, star questions, uh, situational questions. Uh, but along my career, usually they will struggle. And the difference between those that have an answer very quickly and very fact-based, you can make a cut between those and the ones that are producing theoretical answers like, oh, I'm, you know, I was, um, I was working and I knew my manager needed this, so uh, I knew I had to give it in to him uh, before he asked. It's like, so what was it? When? And they start melting right in front of you. And it's like, okay. So that was always a good question to see, you know, honesty. If you if you understand that they have those things as a strength, they have plenty of stories to tell. You will see their faces illuminating with what they're telling. Um, and, and that to me has always been a very revealing uh, question. Okay, well, this is what we do here on this pod. We're going to flip it around on you. What are the qualities you're most proud of in yourself? And I'm going to answer this. Uh, I would say, I would, I can tell you three that I think that have been growing and developing towards my career and life. One is curiosity. I have always been extremely curious about things. You know, if you tell you tell me a story today of something I've never heard of, I'm say, okay, well, hold on for a minute. What about this? Tell me more. Second question, third question, fourth question. Maybe we derail the conversation into that because I never heard of that. So I want to know more. Um, I changed industries because of that I in different company types and things like that because I was always curious of learning new things. Second is learning uh, agility. And I think the same way you're curious is how once you learn something, how do you apply it? Right. So if you know something that you heard, for example, the conversation we've been having today, you heard you're someone in the audience listening to a, a conversation about AI. You've never touched it. What do you do after this? Do you go for it? Or do you just say, oh, okay, that was nice. I should be doing it. And then you drop it and go back to whatever you were doing. So agility is I learned something. Now I'm curious. Let me right. find out more. And then the final step is learning. So I'm going to apply it. I'm going to you know, open it and chat GPT and I'm not doing advertising on chat GPT, any kind of AI and said, okay, let me try something, even if I don't know what I'm doing. But taking those steps, I, it, I've always been like that. And I think it helped me a lot to apply what I was learning because I was learning a lot of things, doing courses, coaching, emotional intelligence, leadership, whatever you, you want, but never as to, to keep them as theory. And, and one of the things I did to do that was to actually teach other people. At the moment I learned something, I said, okay, I need to set a workshop about this so I can teach other people. And that's then how you, you start have true domain knowledge. That's how you, once you can start to teach it, that's that last level of understanding. Yeah. Totally good. And, and the third one I would say is passion. You know, and my wife would always say that, you know, I, I, there are too many things that I like. Uh, and I, when I said I like, it's because, you know, I like them. I like to do things. You know, if you say sports, I play. I play sport, football, tennis. Uh, oh, you like the ocean? Yeah, I go. I go paddleboarding. I go with my kids. I go with friends. There, the things that I like, I, I, I dive in. And there are many things that I like. I paint. I carve wood. Um, I play video games. I, I do a lot of stuff, and that they fill my day. And keeping balance of all those things that you like is a challenge, but. I love it. It's the way I see life. You know, how do you get involved and, and flow uh, with the things that you do? Who wants to be apathetic all the time? Passion is beautiful. I love that about you. Mm -hmm. My answer is three. I'll say, I feel like I have high empathy. I feel like I have a growth mindset, which I think is a spinoff of learning agility and curiosity. I definitely am trying to get better and learn and read a bunch, mm -hmm. listen to a bunch, learn from others around me. So getting better this is something that is very, very important to me. And I'm very, very intentional about it. And then I think I build very genuine, deep relationships. Um, I, my ability to connect with people and to want to learn about them and and be somebody that they see as somebody that they want in their corner, um, I think helps me from a management perspective, from a friendship perspective, from a relationship perspective. Um, so those would be the three qualities that I would say that I'm, I'm most proud of. That's you know, great. I mean, Sorry, can you, can you say that you again? You're going to hire me? Of course. Okay, of I'm in. Course. Give me the app. Uh, I'll have AI fill it out. Um, all right, next question. What about when you miss on somebody? Because we all miss every once in a while. Do you have something that you can look back that's a theme or times that you've missed that you wish you would have done this differently? Anything come to mind? Any type of bias maybe? Um, 
I mean, I think at one point, and, and, and this is something, this, this idea of passion and moving and growing and learning sometimes crashes with people that they just don't have it, right? So it, it was always difficult for me to deal with those individuals that may want to be in their place and they have no interest in moving forward. And at the beginning, I, I, saw, I saw that as apathy, like, oh, man, you're missing something in your life. But maturity taught me better. Uh, and I learned to appreciate that not everyone wants the same degree and the same pace of growth, learning, or passion. And they have their own things that they need to appreciate for what they bring into the table, especially when you manage teams. If you have a team of, of all passionate people, everyone is learning, everyone is curious, then nobody will press the brakes when you need to. Nobody will say, this is dangerous. Nobody would say, we're running out of time. <laughs> so you need to understand that diversity is great because of that. And I learned it as I grew up and I have different kids with different personalities. And now I can understand and appreciate those people that live at a different speed and, and like things more calm and more routine and what the value they bring, especially when you don't have them around. Mm, I love that. All right, last hiring question. If I asked about the best hire you've ever made, does anybody in particular come to mind? You don't need to name names, but does anybody come to mind? Um, several people. Um, there was one person that I saw growing from, in, not the one that I mentioned before, but he also started as an intern. He, he got into a function that was in a customer service function, but um, on the information side, he graduated in business administration. He moved, he started studying engineering, computer engineering. Then he moved to a role into a, the, the technical help center. Then he moved to another country uh, from our, our Brazil, Brazil to Argentina, Argentina to Switzerland, Switzerland to the United States. And he built an entire career switching and changing while remaining a great guy. And I I had the chance to help him along the way because I was the one that first hired him. I was the one that brought him from Argentina to Switzerland. And I, I've always felt great about having the chance to be part of that story. Um, it not, it's not because it was my thing. It's definitely his thing. Uh, but just the fact of being part of such a successful and an amazing story have always made me feel proud. Did you know in the interview that he had that level of potential or was it something that surprised you as time kept going on? He kept getting better and better. No, it surprised me for sure. I mean, you always know that when, especially when you recruit and you, you can feel that the person may, may be a great fit for the job, but also the human side, the relationship side and the communication side, you can see this guy could grow, but I never thought it would go the way it did. Love it. All right, last couple of questions because we've kept you a little bit. I know you're in the middle of looking at your next opportunity. What are you mm -hmm. prioritizing in the next place you work, next role, next company? What's important to you? Uh, purpose, 100%. I want to work uh, for a company that has a very strong purpose, a mission that is real, uh, and the people department being part, a critical part of that purpose. And, you know, I want to wake up every morning feeling this passion that I mentioned to you about. You know, being passionate about your work is the greatest thing that could happen to you um, because you invest a lot of time in it. So you're going to have to do it because you have to pay your bills. So if you have to do it, what could be better than to have a job that triggers your passion? So this is what I want. And, and for, for a job to trigger my passion, I need to feel that I'm, I'm doing some, something better for the world, something better for the individuals I will have to work with. Preach, brother. Could not agree more with you. Let me ask you this. Do you have a book you've read recently or any content you've seen recently that you'd recommend for our listeners? A uh, book? I'm actually reading a book that it's, it's a bit old. It's Marcus Aurelius. It's called oh, um, Meditations. Med Meditations. Yeah, great book. I might have it back here. One of my favorites. It's a great book, uh, especially if you're if you're working in a com in a function such as the people function where you always have to deal with ideals and reality. And, and how do you struggle 
uh, and if you have to prioritize one or the other, I think that's a great book of someone that actually managed to do, you know, to keep himself true while doing things that are, could be seen as opposite to what he was trying to achieve. So it's a great book. Um, I like a lot Adam Grant. Um, and uh, and he has, he recently had another one that just came out. I haven't read the newest one yet. But... I haven't read that one either. Um but, you know, I think he, the way he uses examples, the way he, and I, I heard, I read, and I listened to the books. I didn't read those books, uh, but I listened to them. And they're they're fantastic in terms of how it trigger ideas of how you're doing things. I think it's not just as a leader, but also in HR and as a parent. So I like those books too. Love it. All right, last question. If you had one bit of career advice to offer 20-year-old Federico that you didn't know then, but that you know now, and now, now you can go back and give that advice, or maybe to anybody early in career. What would it be? Um, don't see career as a as a you know rigid path. Understand what's around you. Can be curious. Um, don't be afraid of changes. You know, changes, especially in your early career, are fantastic. It, it that's the way to do it. Um, and make mistakes. It's fine. You know, with career, that's the time where you have to make all the mistakes, um, especially when you're trying things out. So that would be my advice. And as a person who lived it, went from uh, marketing to HR and lived in a bunch of different countries and has been so technology savvy, that makes a ton of sense. That's great advice. Federico, I really appreciate you coming on. I hope you had a good time. Looking forward to staying connected. And uh, thanks again. Thank you, Oz. It was great. All right, brother.